In this episode of Connecting Pills, we'll go into the first part of an analysis of Ravel's charming Mother Goose Suite. Hi, I'm Jamil Agrillo, I'm a conductor and composer, and welcome to this episode of Conducted Pills, a series where we look into a classical piece or a part of it and outline its structure and phrasing, orchestration and harmony, with the bonus technical tips for conductors. I want to take a second to thank all of my patrons and to remind you that on my Patreon page you can find the full episodes of Conducting Pills and the extra episodes tackling technical aspects, on top of the live sessions and many other patrons' perks. And now, let's begin! Mamai Loa was originally written as a five-movement piano duet between 1908 and 1910 for two children, Mimi and Jean Godevsky. As it happened with many of his works, Ravel turned the piano version into an orchestral one. The piece was transformed into a ballet first, with the addition of a prelude and the famous Danse du Rouet, and different interludes. In 1911, in view of a performance in ballet form, Ravel made a transcription for a small orchestra of these five infantile pieces. With a further metamorphosis, Mamertois became a concert suite from which the added parts for the ballet disappeared. As the master orchestrator that he was, Ravel makes it seem as if this music was conceived from the beginning with those precise temporal effects in mind. We are now used to Ravel's masterpieces of orchestration, but it is always amazing to hear how much he was able to carve out of the orchestra. The suite is comprised of five pieces. Pavane de la Belle Bois Germaine, Pavane Sleeping Beauty, Petit Poussé, Little Tom Thumb, Les Tronettes Imperatrice de Pagode, Little Ugly Girl, Empress of the Pagodes, Les Entretiens de la Belle et de la Bête, Conversation of Beauty and the Beast, and Le Jardin Ferrique, The Fairy Garden. With its long, sweet and melancholy theme in the Aeolian mode, the Pavane de la Belle au Bois Dormant sees the old woman transforming into a fairy that lulls the sleep of the Sleeping Beauty. The orchestration is magical, a solo second flute accompanied by one horn with mute, doubled by the pizzicato of the violas, also with mute. These are combinations of instruments that only Ravel could think of. The phrase continues with the addition of the first flute, a clarinet, and an oboe. Underneath, the harp, a favorite of Ravel's, the cellos and the basses. The description of the scene continues with the clarinet taking the lead for a few bars, with sparse pizzicatos of the strings underneath. And the first phrase is back, sung by the first flute. Notice the pizzicato underneath is different now. The violas have chords in pizzicato, rolling on all four strings. The phrase in this first short piece ends with the first entrance of the first violins in an airy and thin atmosphere. Notice the chromaticism in the second violins unsettling the harmony. First of all, you need to think sound. What kind of sound do you want at the beginning? What kind of color? What kind of smell? This is what Ravel's music demands. Second, you have a flute and a horn, which already have different timing in the emission of sound, coupled with the pizzicato of the violas. The trick here is to have a small but firm pulse in the wrist on the upbeat, followed by a legato stroke in a small space, and breathe with the players. The fairy soon gives way to Petit Pousset, where a long chant in thirds goes around and around like Tom Thumb looking for breadcrumbs. The first and second violins begin by wandering around in 2-4-3-4-4-4 four, 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 and 5-4 in pianissimo with mute. Nobody else is playing. Do we hear a solitary oboe? replaced at the end of the phrase by an English horn, while the violins leave room to the violas and cellos. This change alone darkens the sound. The texture is enriched by a clarinet in sync with a pizzicato in the double basses. The same material is retaken by the strings with an added chromatic scale, and with an upward progression we arrive at a forte molto espressivo. Notice that the strings still have the mutes on. It's nothing violent or desperate, more like the sigh of Tom Thumb's surprise of not finding any of the crumbs he had left behind. The music falls back on itself and the same material underlines that magic orchestration that gives life to the birds. 
Look at how it's built. Harmonics of a solo violin answered by a piccolo, a flute, other two solo violins in trills, and the glissando of the rest of the first violins. The theme comes back in the strings and in a fascinating combination of piccolo and solo cello. And we get to the final episode, which retakes the chromaticism we saw at the end of the previous movement. The movement ends as it began, the violins wandering around on different meters while the entrance of the oboe remains suspended unanswered. The sighing of Tom Thumb is depicted at the end of the third bar of number three. Before the last eighth note, you need a bigger lift, which will create a spontaneous breath and a consequent effect. Thank you very much for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button right below the video and ring the bell so you will get notified every time a new video comes out. If you want to support the show monetarily, you can do so on my Patreon page, and if you're interested in conducting technique, follow my Facebook group. All the links are in the description. Let me know in the comments what you think about this piece and if you have any suggestions for future videos. And I look forward to seeing you next week with a new episode of Conducting Fields when we will finish our analysis of Ravel's Mamerla. In the meanwhile, please continue to enjoy music and be well. Ciao! You do. Follow the line with pitch registration, for instance, upwards for two beats, pulse on three because of the tie, and down for two beats. On bar three, pulse on two.